Our scripture lesson this morning is from the New King James Version. And it's, the scripture is John chapter 4, verses 10 through 15. If you have your Bibles with you, you may turn to that. Jesus answered and said to her, if you, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank it himself as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this, his holy word. Pretty sure there's no way that I can uh, follow up that children's moment. So I, I say we all just go home. Uh, there's your lesson for today. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one that things just don't always go as planned. <laughs> that, that was good. Thank you, Wendy, for agreeing to uh, step in there and do that for me. Uh, I used to be a big believer in coincidence. I don't know if you're a big believer in coincidence, but it seemed like, you know, things would always just kind of come together and the stars would always align. And I used to be um, a big believer in luck, good luck and bad luck, and a little bit of a believer in superstition and, you know, those children's rhymes, uh, step on a crack, break your mother's back. I walked to school. That's not a good thing to have to abide by when you walk to school. It's exhausting to go to school. Or, uh, you know, circle, circle, dot, dot, and I've got my, do you know the rest? Cootie shot, yeah. That was really important, too, when the boys were chasing you on the playground. Had my magic eight ball that I would consult before I had to make big decisions. Never said what I wanted it to say, but that's okay. Uh, but, you know, I used to even have, like, little mantras in my mind that I would have to say. And I really believed that if I didn't fulfill every part of that mantra that, you know, something was going to happen, something bad was going to happen. Uh, when I was in color guard, I thought that a certain pair of socks and underwear would ensure success because they happened to one time. I don't know if, if you've ever... <laughs> fallen into any of those kinds of traps. It, it's kind of common, you know, believing in those silly things. And thankfully, I've grown some, and I can now walk confidently down the sidewalk with God at my side, and I step on the cracks. And today, maybe even a little bit of ice as well, and everything pretty much works out okay. Some people would argue that this encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well was a matter of coincidence. But if you know the Jesus that I know, I think you'll agree that there was no coincidence, nothing haphazard about this encounter. You see, at this point in Jesus' ministry, the, the big dogs, the Pharisees, they're getting a little suspicious. They're seeing this Jesus guy in action. And they're seeing all of these followers. And they're getting a little bit nervous. And I would argue probably a little bit jealous, probably a little bit insecure. And Jesus recognizes that mm, maybe it's time to move on. And so he leaves where he's been preaching and teaching in Judea, and he goes north to Galilee, not in fear. He wasn't running away from them, but he had more work to do. And so he knew that now was not the time for a confrontation, so he packed things up and he moved along in order to continue that work. So he travels north to Galilee, which you could have taken a couple of different routes. There's the three-day route that would go straight through, or you could take the seven-day route that would kind of skirt around. And the scripture tells us in verse 4, he had to go through Samaria on the way. And it's that word had that I kind of obsess over. Because I think if we just read it on a surface level, we would think, oh, well, you know, that was the route. That's the way he went. But he didn't have to. He chose to. 
It wasn't uncommon for Jews in that time to have taken that longer route, to skirt around Samaria, because there was no way that they would have intentionally had any kind of contact. Because to the Jews, there was this long-standing disgust with the Samaritans. They considered them a half-breed. They considered them mongrels. Their religion was part Judaism, because they, they believed in Moses, and they followed the laws and the rituals of Moses, but they didn't believe in any other prophets. They, they thought this Messiah was going to come, but that was it. And so the remainder of their religion, from the Jewish standpoint, was really paganism. And so they didn't want to have any kind of contact with that. And so Samaritans were acceptable to trade with, but that was pretty much it. So why then did Jesus have to go through Samaria? And that's the question to kind of tuck away for a little bit. Verses 5 and 6 tell us that eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sichar, <coughs> excuse me, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and if you've been following the Israel trip um, online, you might have seen pictures of Chris actually drawing water from Jacob's well. Wouldn't it have been cool if I could have been there and given this message from there, but it just wasn't meant to be, and that's okay. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime, and his disciples go off to find food, and he's there alone, and a Samaritan woman approaches. She approaches this well to draw water. And a woman coming for water is not unusual. That would have probably been part of her daily duties, part of her chores for her household. But this woman walking alone, likely in the heat of the day, this tells us a lot about her. And, you know, drawing water was supposed to be a social thing. It was a time when in early morning or maybe in the evening, escaping from the hot sun, the women would gather together and they would walk together to the well. And they would chat and maybe share about their days. And, you know, there was safety in numbers. And it was a little bit of, of a break for them, a time of fellowship for them. And, I mean, after all, if we can't go to the bathroom alone today, why would we have expected women in that time to go and draw water alone? So we come by this biblically. I'm just throwing that out there. So the fact that she's here at this time of day by herself tells us that this is a woman who has a story. This is a woman who is not part of the, the in crowd. But this doesn't concern Jesus. He's weary. He's hot. And I actually love that about Jesus. You know, that, that here God in human form is tired like I am. He gets weary like you do. And it's just that reminder that he did come for us. And in fact, he's weary and he's exhausted because of us. But he asks her for a drink, which is a really preposterous question at this time, for a number of reasons. Because what we see here is Jesus breaking rules. He's breaking social rules. He's breaking cultural boundaries um, and, and even some religious rules as well. Because again, Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. So there's number one. Number two, men did not speak to women in public without their husbands present. And in fact, if you search back far enough, um, there could even be grounds for divorce there if a woman were seen you know, speaking familiarly to another man who was not her husband. Rabbis like Jesus certainly did not associate with shady women like this loner at the well. And if he did in fact take a drink from her jar, he would have been ceremonially unclean. So there are a number of reasons why Jesus could have ignored her, should have ignored her. So what was he thinking? And she wonders that too. He's willing to break the rules, but she's not. And in verse 9, she says, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And it's here that Jesus the Messiah, he reveals himself more to this lowly Samaritan outcast than he, in fact, has done even to his disciples at this point in his ministry. And he responds to her, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. And I put myself in her shoes, and I think about this woman who clearly has a past, and we don't know it yet, 
And she's just, you know, probably going to this well thinking that no one's going to be there. She's just going to go there. She's going to do her work. She's going to get her water. She's going to go back. And now this Jew is bothering her and asking her for water and talking about living water. It's craziness. What could this be about? None of it makes sense. And she can only think in terms of the physical, of the here and now. She's not on that eternal plane that Jesus is clearly on. And so she questions him with skepticism. Well, how are you going to do that? You don't have a rope. You don't have anything to collect this water in. But he's not put off by these questions. He's not thrown off by her doubt or her skepticism, just like he's not thrown off by our doubt and our skepticism. And he continues with really what is a mini version of the gospel. In verses 13 and 14, he says, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Forget that stagnant water. Forget that water that runs out. We're talking about eternity here. But she still doesn't get it. She thinks we're still talking about something physical, the temporal. And she exclaims in verse 15, Please, sir, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. We see her motive, and Jesus sees her motive. To avoid the process of walking to this well alone. To avoid the process of just the physical energy that it would have taken to draw the water from the well, to not have to make that trip, sounds pretty good to her. And because she still doesn't get it, Jesus in his patience, he continues. See, he already knew this woman, and he already knew her history, because after all, he's Jesus. He knows everything. And so he says to her, well, go and get your husband, knowing full well that she has none. And it's at this point in the story that we learn what Jesus already knew about her, that this woman has, in fact, had five husbands, which in itself is not really that big of a deal. I mean, in in those days, life was hard. People didn't necessarily live very long lives. And if a woman was widowed, her future was pretty bleak. There wasn't really anyone to take care of her. And so the the natural step was you remarry and you continue on with the family. That's not the scandalous part. The scandalous part, and what she confesses then, is that the man she calls her husband right now, number six, is not actually her husband. And that is scandalous. Can you just hear the hens pecking for this woman? I know women, and I know how women talk. And I can only imagine what this Samaritan woman's life was like having lived through five husbands, probably doesn't have any children, for likely if she had had daughters, they would be the ones drawing the water, not her. And here she's probably the topic of conversation and scorn. And I would imagine that there probably had been days where she tried to walk to the well with the other women. And they probably looked at her and maybe pointed some fingers and kind of snickered because, sadly, that's kind of what women do sometimes. And it makes it very clear to me then why we now see her traveling to this well by herself in the heat of the day. Water's a necessity. You have to have it. It's a basic of life. But she can't bear to fetch that water in the eyes of everyone else. She can't bear the glares and the feelings of shamefulness and the recognition of what she's done. And so instead, she suffers, and she chooses to go alone, and she chooses the hottest time of the day. And I wonder what kind of life this must have been for her, and how dead she must have been feeling inside. And now here's this person who seems to know all about her, who can look at her and tell her everything she's ever done in her adult life. And he speaks kindly to her, and he speaks gently to her, and he's promising her living water. He's offering life to the dead, and it's at that point that she knows. She recognizes him, and she kind of skirts around it a little bit. 
oh, well, well, you must be a prophet. But keep in mind, Samaritans didn't believe that there were any prophets beyond Moses until this Messiah came. And so even though she doesn't say, you must be the Messiah, the fact that she is acknowledging him as a prophet tells us she knows. And she's confident enough in it that she rushes back to the village. And this woman who has been scorned and shamed and outcast from others is the one who goes to them and says, mustn't this be him? Listen, he's told me everything about my life. Don't you think that this might be the one? And her life is changed. And so are the lives of a multitude of others. So why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? Well, he didn't. But he went because he knew that there were people there who needed to hear his message. And he went there because he knew that he was sent not only to save the Jews, but to save the entire earth. And he knew that if he didn't break those social boundaries and those barriers, no one else was going to do it. That's what he was sent here for. He lived a life that modeled righteousness and purity and love, and that's a life that we are to embrace and to imitate. Oh, how he loves. I'm drawn to this story for a number of reasons. I'm drawn to the story of acceptance, and I'm drawn to this message of forgiveness, and I'm drawn to the message of hope, and I'm drawn to this Samaritan woman. I feel like I get her, not because I've had five husbands, nor do I hope to have five husbands, and not really because I've been ostracized by other women, although that kind of sums up middle school for me, and I don't, I don't know if that sums up middle school for any of the rest of you or not, but, uh, but because I identify with her because she spends her day laboring to quench a thirst that she cannot quench. She's alone, and she's exhausted. And she feels hopeless. And she goes back day after day after day. And she draws the water and draws the water. But it's never enough. It never really feels that, fills that need. And in essence, she's drawing from the wrong well. She's drawing from a well with a lowercase w. Instead of the one with the capital. In my experience, we spend our lives thirsting for love and for acceptance and for meaning. And we all draw from different wells of water for that thirst and at different points in our lives. As a kid, maybe we draw from the well of friendship. Well, if I just have enough friends, and if I just dress this way, and if I just do this activity, and if I just do whatever they want me to do, then I'm gonna feel complete, and I'm going to feel loved, and I'm going to feel accepted. Or maybe we draw from the well of athletics. Well, if I just make that team, and if I just score the winning shot, and if I just pour my entire heart into every practice and being the best and hearing the cheers, then I'm going to feel loved and accepted. But what happens when you don't make the winning shot? What happens when you don't do the right thing for those friends to accept you? And some of us, we've been drinking from the well of parental acceptance. If I just do what my mom wants me to do, if I just become the person that my dad wants me to be, if I act the right way and if I say the right things, then I'll be loved and I'll be accepted and I'm going to feel complete. And we continue to move on. Some of us, we dip into that well of work. If I just throw myself 110% into this, if I do the best job that I can, then the praise will come, and the acceptance, and the love. But what happens when that job is over? What happens when the layoff is imminent? Maybe we draw from the well of family. We devote ourselves to our children. Well, if I just bring them to church every Sunday, and if I just teach them the right way, and if I get them the clothes that they really want, and if I put them into all of the activities that they want, and I get them a tutor, and I love them, and I hug them, and I provide every single thing they could possibly want to make sure they're happy and healthy, and I read the parenting books, 
and I tick off the amount of quality time that I spend with them each day, then they will love me, and they will accept me, and they will fulfill me. But what happens when that kid leaves the nest? Or what happens when that prodigal child takes off and leaves you in the dust? Some of us dip into the well of relationships. I was guilty of this big time in my younger years. Well, if I just become the person that he wants me to be, if I give him what he wants, if I say what he wants me to say, if I dress the way he wants me to to dress, then he will love me and he will accept me. But what happens when the relationship ends? And I don't know if you can relate to any of these. Maybe you dip into the well of religion, which you're like, whoa, we're sitting in church here. Why are we talking about religion? It's supposed to be a good thing. No. Maybe you're checking off the list. I'm in the seat at church. Volunteer. I help with this. I give my money. I make sure everybody else knows how much I pray and volunteer and go through the motions of being a good Christian what happens when we encounter those dark days anyway, even though we've been following all the rules that we thought we were supposed to follow? Maybe like me, you dip into the well of perfectionism, of making sure that you dot every I and cross every T and all the bases are covered and you're dependable and everyone can count on you and once that happens, then the mistrust and the lack of confidence, it will go away what happens when it rears its ugly head. The problem you see is is that we are drawing from these wells and it's exhausting because it's never ending. It's toilsome and it's dangerous and in the end it's fruitless. It's absolutely fruitless. We dip into each of these wells searching for love and searching for acceptance and meaning and those things are natural. Those desires are natural. God created us to have relationship with him. And we've been seeking each other out since the fall. But we're drinking from the wrong well. And Jesus makes us abundantly clear in his encounter with the Samaritan woman. The point is that he is the well. The well with the big capital W. It's his free gift to us. He's the only path to eternal life. We deceive ourselves if we think that any amount of money or success, or approval, or relationship status, or family will ever take the place of a relationship with God. We're deceiving ourselves. Yes, family and friends and money can make life's burdens easier, but they don't take them away. And they don't create the blessings for us. Burdens will be there, and it's only Jesus who can carry them from us. So I wonder if you can relate to this Samaritan woman as well. Can you relate to her feelings of negativity and her loneliness, her feelings of imperfection and unworthiness? And maybe you're sitting there saying, you know, this sounds all great in theory and whole well with a capital W. All right, I get it. That's Jesus. But you don't know me. And you don't know what a mess I've made from my life. That Samaritan woman, she's got nothing on me. It doesn't matter. The well is for you too. You're invited to it. He crosses those boundaries. He crosses those barriers. And he crosses them for you and for me. I can remember clearly um, a couple of weeks before I was baptized, because I was baptized as an adult, sitting in Craig Duke's office and just sobbing. And he said, why are you crying? And I said, because I don't deserve this. And he said, you're right, you don't. But he loves you. And it's time. And I sobbed through my baptism. He sprinkled that water, and I don't know if it was the water running down my face or tears and snot or what else, because I was a mess, feeling so unworthy. And we are. We all are. But that's why he came. So let him take that from you. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. He chose to. He chose her, and he chooses you and he chooses me. Oh, how he loves. 
that he makes himself known to the, vag- the vagabonds, to the sinners, to the outcasts, to you and me. How he loves that he offers us this gift of eternal salvation. If we but just turn to him and accept him and drink in his living water. Don't be deceived. There is only one well that offers things far sweeter than anything this world could offer. Let's pray. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters since the dawn of creation, hear our prayers today. We are spiritually thirsty. We long to know your presence. We long to feel your comfort. And sometimes we don't know where to find you. We pray for ourselves and for others who are alone, who are without hope, who long to feel needed and loved, and who may be searching in all the wrong places. We may be searching in all the wrong places, but we know, Father, that you seek us out, that you reach out your hands to us, that you draw us to the well, that you draw us to the living water. We pray for those who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough water to drink or to feed their animals, whose fields are parched, who walk long distances to find enough water to survive, who have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for those whose families and homes are torn apart because of drought or famine. Healing Father, pour down your waters. Heal your people. Heal your people. In your name we pray.